Welcome to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners optimize income, pay less in tax, and invest prudently. Here's your host, Grant Bledsoe. Hello, everybody. Grant Bledsoe here. Welcome back to Grow Money Business. This week on the show, my guest is Michael Kappel. Michael is the founder and managing director of Lakelet Advisory Group, which provides strategic and transactional support for biz, mis, uh, mid and larger size business uh, businesses around the country and, and even around the world in some circumstances. Michael's had uh, quite the interesting career. He started out at PricewaterhouseCoopers as an accountant, then he got into venture capital, then he started his own mergers and acquisitions advisory firm, and, uh, and then a few years later, his own private equity firm. He joins us today to talk about ESOPs as a viable option for business exits. And if you're someone who owns a business and is thinking about exiting in the next couple of years, you're starting to look around at what your options are, this is something that you might want to consider. Because if you structure it properly, it can provide tax deferral and all the gains you'd otherwise have to pay income tax on. So Michael joins us today to talk about the ins and outs of ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans, who might be a good candidate for this, who might not be a good candidate for this, what the costs are, what you need to know, who you need on your team, and what the other features and benefits are. Michael is really easy to talk to. Uh, He was very educational. I'm really happy that that he uh, lent us a little bit of his time to share some of this wisdom that he's picked up over the last few decades. But he's seen a lot of stuff. He's seen the good and the bad and the ugly. And I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hey, everyone. I need to interject quickly to remind you all that nothing found in today's episode or any other episode of Grow Money Business should be considered financial, investing, legal, tax, fitness, or even relationship advice. It's content that you're free to use and to deploy on your own terms. And before taking any actions on content found on the show, please do consult with your tax professional, your attorney, or your financial planner. If you don't have a financial planner, head on over to threeoakswealth.com to learn more about what we do in terms of financial planning and investments and how we help clients on an ongoing basis. Michael, welcome. Welcome to the show. It's really, really good to meet you. And and I'm really excited to to talk about ESOPs. As you mentioned just a moment ago before we started recording, uh, it's an opportunity that's kind of in vogue these days for a number of reasons. And, you know, there's a lot of gory details with the uh, planning related to ESOPs and the management, the operational structure that I, if I frankly don't know about. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you on and have you uh, enlighten us all on this subject. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Grant. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, the ESOP trend is significantly inclu- increasing significantly as a result of the pandemic. Uh, the reason being that uh, people, many small, mid-sized companies want to uh, get rid of the company in a structured succession plan. And the advantage of the ESOP process is you know you have a buyer at the end of the deal. If you would go through a private equity or your own sale, 65% of those transactions never materialize, whether it be as a result of the valuation, uh, due diligence problems, a whole host of reasons, the entire gamut. And the other challenge is too often that many of the companies are finding what the players, the buy, potential buyer put on the table, it's not the final, final price. You know, they go through uh, due diligence and they get nickel and dime. Players, the buyer may not be buying the company he thought that they were buying. And there's always some adjustments between the initial offer price and the final price. It's very rare that they're one and the same. It's, it'd be anomaly. The other challenge is when you go through a private equity, although you're going to get, if it goes through, if you're one of the 35% that lucky enough to go through, you're going to possibly get more money than you would from an ESOP. ESOP has some limitations, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the key thing with the ESOP, though, is you control the process going through what you don't with a private equity. Now, even though the amount of money you may receive Net net going through an ESOP is less than the traditional route, the non ESOP route. When you consider the tax savings, it is significantly better to go through an ESOP route if the company is profitable and has at least 15 employees. If you do it smart, there's a section 1042 in the IRS code. Hate 
quoting out sections, but there is a section in the IRS code. If you do the ESOP properly and have the right team backing you, all the capital gains can be deferred ad infinitum. So that 15%, and if it could be higher if you're in a state like New York or other states where you also have to pay capital taxes on such transactions, that's a significant savings. That's about guaranteed minimum of 15%, could be up to 23%, the state in which the company resigns. 23% of the gain is going to be significantly more than the delta between a private equity and the ESOP. Right, right. So why don't why don't we start with this, Michael? Um, why don't we lay out the landscape of of potential buyer? If if you're in this position, you're a few years away from thinking about your own exit. <clears throat> Hopefully, you're not six months away from your own exit, and you haven't thought about through this stuff yet. Uh, really, this needs to take place, you know, several several years before you really want to get out. You have a variety of parties that might be interested in paying you for your business and allowing you to exit. You can sell to uh, a third party, you can sell to an independent party, you can sell to a competitor in some kind of private uh, deal with a, a variety of financing options. One really popular option that a lot of people have jumped to over the last couple of decades is a sale to private equity, but that comes with its own complications. Uh, I've heard a lot of stories about employees who remain after a sale to private equity being really unhappy about what private equity does and their partners do after they come on board. And being in a higher interest rate environment today, I suspect, I don't know this to be fact, but I suspect that the uh, demand from the private equity space has probably come down a little bit because of the, the capital dynamics there. Uh, or you could sell to your kids, you could sell to employees. W what am I missing from, from, from these options? What are, what are your other possibilities? Well, the other possibility we just talked about is the ESOP. Uh, you can sell it to the employees without an ESOP. We see the trend for that. But if you're going to do that, you're going to give it over to the employees. You're just losing that major tax advantage that I just previously spoke about. The other challenge is with regards to private equity. And I know that area well. I co-founded a very successful private equity firm. And I can speak to the fact that a private equity transaction is going to take you six to nine months if you're lucky, if it is successful. ESOP's going to take you about the same length of time. The, the, the advantage is if you go out there and no matter which of those options we explored, Grant, you can really have to take a look based upon the individual company. One size does not fit all. What is the objective of the current owners? Is it dollar for dollar to get the most they can? Then they should be hunting for a strategic business partner who can acquire them because a strategic business partner can get the synergies, have the client base, et cetera, and all the assets necessary to go to the next level very quickly. If it is to take care of all the employees, you can either sell the company directly to the employees without the tax benefits, or you can create an ESOP if you're profitable and have the right uh, product offering. So you, you have several options available to you. It's a little bit more challenging now. The cost of money, as you properly stated, Grant, has gone up significantly in the last year. And that's a big deal with it. I mean, you're, you're paying, you know, an extra 5 6%, a 5 6% of a deal. It can be significant. And that 5% is each and every year that the money's out there. So the key is to no matter which one you're going to go through, you really need a bona fide succession planner to go through it. And as you correctly stated, don't think you can do this in six months. You want to have at least one full business cycle behind you. You got to clean up your financial statements. As a minimum, you need a financial review from a CPA at a minimum. If you know you're going to go through one of these things, you might as well invest in it and get an audit because sooner or later when they do the due diligence, they're going to have to go back and recreate the balance sheet from the applicable period. The other thing is, is so key is invest some time and energy into your senior staff. Because if you're thinking about an ESOP or even an employee buyout, it's the staff that's going to take you to the promised land. Let's suppose hypothetically you're not even going to do one of those two that you might even want to explore a private equity firm. Well, as you know, the private equity players, they're betting on the jockeys. 
Who's going to be there? Who's going to be the CEO? Who's going to be the CFO? It's different when he's a, he or she's a bookkeeper. But when you're playing with someone else's money, like a private equity firm, which is tens of millions of dollars, you can have someone who's got their act together. And often, and the people are very surprised about this, you could have the best COO, but he or she may not be a good CEO. There's a difference between being a first officer on a ship and a captain. And it, it, it is significant. So you've got to help with that transition to help the people. And even for selfish reasons, by training the people and exploring the options and career development, you're really helping yourself, yourself being the company owner. Right, right. So in, in simple terms, so we, we've heard about the potential for substantial tax benefits by using an ESOP. How would you describe what an ESOP is in simple terms? In simple terms, the ESOP is you are selling a company to a trustee, not the employees. And the trustee oversees the company and the benefits of the company go to the employees. Many people think that the employees end up with the company. Technically, legally, that's not applicable. It's the trustee. And there's another thing about using a trustee is you have a bona fide expert who's going to keep their eye on the ship, okay? You have to have audited financial statements. You have to have a business valuation by an independent accredited business valuator. So you have these safeguard rails built in to an ESOP to do it, where normal small mid-sized companies may not have that if they just sell it over to their employees. And those guardrails I just mentioned can be pretty significant. The other thing I think that is underrated in the whole process. And it doesn't have to be via ESOP, but any small mid-sized company, you should have a decent board of directors. And the ESOP really forces that. We all know that the board of directors, if it does exist, it's just there once a year, sign tax returns and do things along those lines. It's not a constructive board to look at the product, the offering, the pricing. A strategic board of directors, and the ESOP has that which is a major advantage when you're dealing with a small to mid-sized company. So walk us through a transaction then. You're, you're, you, let's say you've got a, a business and you decide that this is the best avenue for you. You hire some help. You get the business valued. You hire an accountant. Hopefully you have your financials audited by then. You definitely need some help from uh, an attorney who knows this space intimately. And then I, I would suspect that a trust is created and the trustee is named uh, uh, to represent the interests of the employer uh, employees buying the, uh, the, the shares. Uh, did I describe that accurately? Yeah, that, that is the uh, process going in. And the only thing I would add to that, Grant, is you want to get people who've done this a couple of times. There's some crazy nuances in the ESOP legislation where if you're uh, – a C corp versus an S corp and flipping them around that, you know, it can trigger some events. And one of the many things, as we know, when you deal with the IRS, if you go into that under one corporate structure, it's very difficult to change it. And if you change it and don't do it properly, all the tax benefits that the previous owner had can be jeopardized or clawed back. Must you be a corporation to do this? Can a partnership or LLC engage in an ESOP? Yes. There's a uh, law firm, coincidentally, in Florida we're working with now who wants to be a partnership, continue the partnership, and do it. There are a couple uh, nuances to do that. They're a little bit different, but it can be done. Interesting. So, so what, happens, what happens next? Walk, walk us through the mechanics of one of these transactions. Once they decide to do it and they hire a team, uh, the team will improve the value of the company. How so? Let's suppose it's a financial service company. You would probably do things like do a SOC report, service organization control, to show that the processes are in place, document all the processes. That would add some value. You would start to taking a look at things that would jeopardize a business valuation, the risk. How do you mitigate the risk? Uh, diversification of clients. Try to get clients, if you have clients now, under long-term contracts. Normally, suppose the contract is one year. See if you can get 18 months, two years. Anything these little things would push out 
output. When you do a business valuation, these things add up to some significant points because you've got the multiplier effect. So people say, okay, I'm going to do an ESOP, say, a year from now. That's great. They're planning to do that. But you have to realize if you do everything properly for every dollar you add value, it's not going to be. The multiple could be five, six, seven times. So it behooves you to really be aggressive and put in the necessary procedures and processes to add value. And and by multiplier effect, just for the benefit of our listeners, usually the valuation is based on some multiple of, of something, either revenue or more frequently EBITDA or cash flow or profitability kind of varies by situation and industry. But if you do these qualitative things, document your processes and, and have some uh, or you, and, and, and uh, put your clients into long, longer term contracts, whatever the case may be, that increases the multiple at which your uh, business could be valued. And, and so if on day one, your business is worth five times free cash flow by going through these steps and checking these boxes, well, you could wake up two years later and it could be worth seven and a half times cash flow. And that's a really substantial number. Um, yeah, Correct yeah, me if I'm wrong, Michael. This is not no, my spot, intimate space. You're spot on, Grant. And there's some simple things to do that people say, get your employees under contract. Have a have a yep. non-compete. Someone yep. doesn't want to buy your company knowing the next day they could build up a shop right across the street. Yeah. So these yep. things do not cost you a lot of money, but they add significant value for the end result, whether the end result be an ESOP trustee, a private equity, or any of the options we discussed earlier. And you, so, someone who's done this transaction, these transactions often, and sit down and map it out. It's it's planning. And yep. is there some upfront cost? Yes, Grant, there is. But if you do this right and someone's worth their weight and salt, is they have to go through this process. They'll get multiple fold back. So you 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 bring in the specialist. You start going through the steps to increase with their help. Uh, yes. steps to increase the value of the company. What happens next? Are, are employees ponying up cash to buy the shares from you? Is the trustee yeah. coming up with yeah, cash and borrowing that, money? How, what, what happens next? That's a good point. Uh, previously, let me say when the ESOP started out, employees were almost, it was the norm for employees to kick in a little bit of blood, sweat, and tears and a little bit of cash. Nowadays, it doesn't work that way. That's by far the uh, exception. The employee will get the benefits based upon the tenor, the salary. You can create how you want to get the employees. As long as you're consistent and document the process, the trust will go along with you. You can say, okay, everybody who's been with me for seven years is going to get X percent plus something at the end. And, and mm -hmm. that's the way you can do it. They need not uh, put in money. And it's becoming rarer now that they do. You, you almost are putting uh, golden handcuffs on hourly employees, which is not a bad thing in today's market because we know the challenges of the labor market. This definitely protects the labor market. If you have someone who's there, and let's say it's a warehouse, for example, hypothetically, and uh, he drives uh, a forklift within the warehouse and he has four years vested and it's a five-year vester, he or she would be crazy to walk away in a year, given what they could end up as a result of the ESOP opportunity. So it really is, I refer to as often, it is golden handcuffs on hourly and mid-level managers. So if you're, if you're a manager of the warehouse, then you're going along managing the warehouse. All is good. You like it, but you can walk away at any point. You're making an hourly wage. And then when if, if the ownership decides to go through this route, down this road, uh, upon the completion of the transaction, you could wake up with an interest in the company that vests over an indefinite period of time. Is, is it seven years it's, the longest it, you could go? Seven years is usually the longest now in today's market. I mean, it's five, five years is a, a norm uh, for right. a higher level of executives, but you want to be consistent. But you can have its grant such that it could be five years plus what they have to date. So if he or she was already there four years, they just got another year to go through to get the benefits. Or you can you can set it up virtually any way that you want with the advice of an attorney, as long as it's consistent 
and it's well documented and it's communicated to all the employees. Those are the really the prerequisites to get the benefits from that. Now, can you have an alternative tier like the CEO, CFO, COO, chief marketing officer gets more? Yes. The way you could do that is to also have part of it be based upon their base salary. So obviously, if someone's making $200,000 a year and it's a percentage of base salary and the warehouse manager that you stated is only making $85,000, the executive gets to have a higher percentage at the end. But again, you have flexibility to do it any way you want to because every employee group and service companies are everything's different. So th- then it comes to actually transferring ownership. And uh, I, I, I don't believe there's any you know, minimum uh, um, portion of your company that has to go into the ESOP. But basically, you, you sell whatever stake you want to sell to the trust. And the trustee that we were talking about earlier is responsible for handling that portion of the company, that asset inside the trust for the benefit of all the beneficiaries of the trust, which are the employees, um, based on the, the, the terms that we were just discussing. So where's the money come from? Uh, How do you get that, paid? That's, you, uh, if you pick the right business partners to help you out, and it is very important, uh, the money comes from uh, the private sector. There are certain uh, organizations that just invest in, uh, in ESOPs. You have to go out there and find the money. There's some banks that do it, but banks have been very reluctant to do it. Uh, it's not something they're comfortable with. It's really not something that's well known that, you know, it's not their it's not their bailiwick, quite candidly. And, you know, they have to go outside. But the money is relatively not that difficult to get because of the fact, as I alluded to before, is in addition to have a good track record, which is a prerequisite for the ESOP, and it has a positive EBITDA. And you're doing all these things, but you also have a trustee, you have financial audited financial statements, and you have some decent players involved. You have a board of directors. So for a small, mid-sized company, that's the cream of the crop, all right? I mean, most small companies don't have that. So there are significant protections to invest in there. And the investor can also, working with an ESOP in upstate New York, where one of the investors is a, I don't want to say a private equity firm, but close to it, as close as you can get, and he's going to get a taste of it. He's putting up $25 million, but he wants of the equity, he was going to get X percentage. So when the, the trustee has everything, the employees will end up, in my example, in this company, 93%, and the private equity firm is also going to trigger another 7% that he gets a buyback after a certain period of time based upon the independent accredited business valuation. So there, you can find a lot of ways to uh, raise the money, again, because you really don't go to employees anymore. Right. The other, the other situation you have to be very realistic about, Grant, is if you're going to go through the ESOP route, I would be surprised if the current owner was not going to have to hold 25%, okay, on the seller mm-hmm. note paper. Uh, is that a lot? Yeah. It can be a minimum of three years, and it's usually going to be subordinated. But also the fact is that the the taxes, again, are the benefit. Net, net, you'll come out the same. If you go more than 25%, you got to realize how much you're in there. To mitigate that, though, you can also have set up, you don't have to sell 100% of ESOP. People have that, it's all or nothing. No, you usually want to keep less than 30% to make the numbers work if you're a medium-sized company. If you're much larger, you can be much more creative. You know, someone's going to—they're going to have to hold some of the paper, and it's—it's uh, it's just a fact of life. I, I heard so many times. Well, you know, you try this process, you don't. Well, you say that, but when you go out to get the funding and financing, and it also protects whoever does come in with the financing. Okay, you got the twenty-five percent sure. of the company. The company's doing well. I have very little chance of not getting paid. Now, the old right. seller, yeah. And then the old seller usually will stay on the board or be an advisor, and the ESOP usually likes that. Uh, they, they may not be an employee, 
They may not be a CEO or something, but they, they might be a strategic advisor, board member, because he or she has all the connections in the business. We know the importance of a few key executives. And by having them around, they have a vested interest also to get the capital. So well, when it comes time to pull the trigger on this, you got, you've got everything set up, <clears throat> you go out and find money. And if you have uh, appropriate or sound advisors experience in this space, it shouldn't be that hard to find money, especially if the seller is uh, retaining some subordinated note of at least 25%. So if they're, if they're getting cash out of the deal, then they're lending at least 25% of that cash back to the company. The company needs to pay them in a subordinated way on an ongoing base, three, three years plus, however you want to do it. Yeah. And so at that point, the shares of the company have transferred into the, have been transferred into the ESOP and, and you can cut other equity partners into it at that point to raise the money. You can uh, borrow it from other sources. I would guess that in most cases, the employees are owning more than fifty-one percent of more than fifty percent of the company at that point. Is that is, is that the, the right? Trustee, the trustee is owning more than fifty. The trustee percent. does. Yes. And so at that point, the, the the trustee must have all the power to hire and fire the board, and. Well, management and so forth. How, how does how does that work? Unique, no, that's Grant. That's a good point. It's a very unique uh, situation. The trustee, he or she, is the uh, advisor to all the employees and is there to fiduciary responsibility to protect the assets of the company and the future yeah. of the company. Very, very rarely will they, being the trustee, put in a new board or get a new CEO. There is such a process for that before the papers are signed and everybody goes that the CEO and the board is in place. Uh, you have all the play. It would be very unusual for a trustee to go in there and fire the people. Now, if there's fraudulent activity or someone's not up to it and the board agrees, look at the CFO's just not cutting it, we really need to change. And of course, that's the prerogative. But it's not that easy to do because you got to remember these are the future owners and these individuals, the executives we're talking about, have skin in the game and equity. It's like a, a partnership. If you're an accounting firm or law firm, it's pretty hard to fire a partner. Yeah. And yeah. they have to go through a, a process to do that, which protects the employees a little bit more. Right, right. So you really and, and want so to go through the planning stages. And make sure you got the right people in place. And more right. times than not, usually you need a stronger CFO. Someone could be a great controller and go along with the company, but with all the financial requirements and someone like that, you almost, you need a CPA level person to go through and do that. You don't need a bookkeeper, even though a bookkeeper may have served well the company up until this juncture. Going forward with all the additional responsibilities, he or she may not have the skill set. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, on an annual basis, then, as the company continues to operate, often in a, uh, as a more levered organization, if you're borrowing money to finance this whole thing, <clears throat> the company continues to operate. It goes out and it engages in the marketplace. It brings in revenue. It's got all, ex all its expenses. And then it's got some profitability, hopefully, at, at the bottom of, of the P&L. Is it still the CEO and CFO making the decision of whether to distribute a dividend back to the trustee and other equity holders versus reinvest rest uh, back with, into the company? With, with the are, consent, are, are, with the consent of the board and the trustee. With the consent of the board of the trustee. So your warehouse manager may or may not be getting cash in his pocket from a dividend that year. That's correct. And okay. I'll be very candid. The first couple of years, it usually wouldn't happen. Right. Because there's so much of the cost going into this transaction and the interest, mm -hmm. the closing costs and everything like that. You just got to manage the expectations, say, realistically, the major benefits kick in post year three. And then in addition to that, you have the cost of doing the ESOP every year, which is significant. You got to pay for a trustee. You got to have audited financial statements. And each and every year, you have to have an unaccredited business valuation performed. So there are some. How much cost are you looking at? Uh, what kind of costs are we looking at to to set the thing up and trigger the transaction, and then on an ongoing basis thereafter? 
generally, I would say you're going to need about, not counting raising the capital, okay? Uh, just going to go through all this, you're going to need about $500,000. Gotcha. Okay. So let's say now, that you're in this situation. And then I would say 180000 going forward every each and every year. One eighty going forward. Pay for forward. the okay. trustee, pay for the auditor. But, okay, you say that's 160. And then I got a hundred and another hundred and eighty or six hundred, so I got seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Well, if the ESOP is goes into an ESOP, there's no taxes. So you get that money back and then some the payback is within eighteen months. Right, right. Which brings me to exactly what I wanted to ask you about next. And that's it, from the seller's perspective. You've set all this up. You uh, the, the business underwrites the cost to set it up and, and so forth. You transfer your shares into the ESA or to the the trustee. I guess is the right terminology. Yes, that's the term. That's and then you get a you get a bunch of cash out of it. So let's say that you come out of it with uh, your business is worth twenty million. You just sold uh, sold it for twenty million dollars. If you did not set this up. You're paying capital gains That's probably right. on that amount, right? At twenty three point eight percent federally, most likely, plus yep. whatever your state our responsibility state is. is, plus whatever the state is. So I'm in California, so let's call it uh, in that situation thirty five percent, more okay. or less. Uh, so it, you, you've got, and I've got my calculator here just to add some tangibility to this. So you know, like a good financial guy, it's right in my hip pocket. Uh, so 35% of 20 million bucks is $7 million that you would have lost to taxes. But by engaging in this transaction with an ESOP, you get the cat $20 million out of the deal and all the capital gains on that is deferred. That's correct. As long as you put that capital that you receive from the transactions, what the IRS calls a certain asset group which is very, very vague, basically is just about any company listed on a stock exchange or any American company. It focuses significantly on U.S. entities. Hmm. Non-U.S. entities, not not an option? Non-U.S., it has to be listed on the market directly or indirectly, ADR, whatever. If it's out there, it can be done. Do you have to keep it in any special kind of account or just as long as it's in your name in any of those vehicles? Your name in any of those vehicles. And then the IRS will defer the taxes. Now, when you take it out, then you're going to pay the capital gains tax. So you can defer it. There are many estates that pass it from one generation to another and two generations later still have not paid taxes on it. Oh, interesting. So you don't get to enjoy a step up in basis then upon death? You can you can be very creative. If this is all set up properly, you can be very creative on kicking the can down the road, virtually ad infinitum if you wanted to. Hmm. And what happens to the dividends and distribution of the interest and so forth that accumulates in the assets you purchase? That's just taxable as, as they would otherwise that be? That would be to taxable. You? Take the yeah. example that... Uh, we're going to put down uh, the old seller, for lack of a better term, has to put down 25%, right? Mm-hmm. And he or she is going to get dividends. And that dividends from uh, or that interest would be taxable. Now, there are ways to put that dividend into the 1042 to minimize the tax. But usually people would live off that. The, 1042, the you mean into the ESOP that we're talking about? Into the ESOP. And yeah, the, 10, the 1042 is the vehicle which the Internal Revenue Service allows you to park the money into a certain asset so you don't have to. The complexity of this thing is mind boggling. And right now, <laughs> yeah, right now, even before Congress, which we know probably won't happen, the S Corp gets, uh, the C Corp gets major tax deferral benefit where an S Corp doesn't. And it just doesn't make sense. So Congress is trying to make it for your bolt. So what people do now, or what we suggest to most of our clients, the day before the transaction or a few minutes before it, you flip and you become a C-Corp. So you get the deferred tax treatment. Ah, so, interesting. 
Interesting. So there are so many triggers that have to be done. You can imagine, Grant, not only with the Internal Revenue Service, but there's another portion of Big Brother who owns is legally responsible for ESOPs, and that's the Department of Labor. So you not only have to constantly appease Uncle Sam via the IRS, you also got the Department of Labor. So setting this up and planning out properly is very, very frustrating, but can be very, very lucrative. And also it's frustrating because when you're going to plan to sell your company hypothetically within the next year, you have a lot of cash going out now. And if you were sell it to a private equity, you really don't pay until the transaction closes. Right. So you got a different end. This is front end loaded with cost. And the normal transaction types we spoke about earlier are usually rear end loaded. So you don't worry about those costs. And it's a lot easier sometimes to get those costs down the road because in your example, you might have $20 million. So if you have to cut a check for that, it's not as painful as the planning out down the road. Right. Right. Interesting. So just to just to put a few pieces together here for for our listeners, you, you know, you 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 have a twenty million dollar company, you sell it and pay seven million of that twenty that you get in capital gains taxes, and now you have thirteen million left over again with a basis of thirteen million if you want to reinvest it, which is helpful, right. of course. Or you shell out half a million dollars plus, um, you know, one hundred and eighty a year thereafter to set up an ESOP and you just continue to kick that can down the road indefinitely and perhaps for future generations. Uh, is there any risk of um, you know Congress stepping in here and changing the rules around that might trigger that uh, taxation on, that, on those cans that are being kicked down the road? Well, nobody really knows on a crystal ball what Big Bro is going to do. No, I, tried I, to, I, I tried to bait you with that one. Yeah. <laughs> but I would say it's very unlikely because they're doing everything they can to get the ESOP market going. Uh, and it's been going very well. And there's a lot of uh, players already in it. They considered, they, Congress considers a big win. It's really meant to for the mid-sized companies. If you're too small, it's very difficult to do. As I stated before, you need, unless it's a really exception, Grant, you need 15 employees to make this thing work. Okay. I would suggest some, they say if you did the numbers, you'd break even at about an EBITDA of uh, one point two million dollars without any crazy adjustments. But realistically, <clears throat> that's the bare minimum. Right. And the big, so if your EBITDA big, is less than a couple million dollars, don't even consider this. Don't don't, don't consider. It. You'll kill yourself with expenses and hassles. It, it just won't work out. The numbers. It just won't. But the bigger the company because of the tax benefits and the planning and things you can do, the more of a reward. Yeah. And if yeah. the bigger companies are starting to look into, and there's some very big ones out there who are doing it, but the, the mid-sized companies in certain industries are doing it. As I mentioned to you before, uh, there's a, a law firm that's doing it. They see the benefit. This, the managing partner wants out. These guys can't pay him for all he wants. He wants to take care of his employees. You know, the employees, that's the value of the firm. So yeah. how do you keep these guys around, these younger partners? Well, I'll give you an ESOP, and after you're invested in X number of years, you guys own the company, or you can't have control of the company. Now, if you take the ESOP route, it's not, uh, you're not handcuffed. We have an ESOP that we're working with in Missouri in that uh, they're in the right space at the right time, okay? They are in the a staffing industry for healthcare. I mean, the last three years for them, they've been printing money. I mean, their EBITDA, without exaggerating, is over doubled every single year. And they know that this phenomenon is going to stop. And they've only been in ESOP for six years, but they want to sell it. So they're going to sell the ESOP and everybody cashes out. So you still, you're not locked in for seven, 10 years if everyone agrees, and in this case, everyone has agreed that we're going to do this transaction, and now they're going to do the transaction, and everybody will be getting their dividend and benefits years earlier than planned. Right, right. That's an interesting concept. And this this threshold of a couple million dollars of EBITDA, and we've we've talked about this on the show a fair a fair amount. You know, the, the purpose of the show is really to 
discuss personal and business financial topics and, and really help people uh, blend those two things together in the way that's best for themselves and their families and everything that they care about pursuant to the missions in their companies and so forth. And, and one concept that we've touched on in the past is, you know, if you're doing half a million dollars in EBITDA, you're a very successful company, but the market for uh, your company when you go to exit on your own is somewhat limited. And if you can pull some strings to get that up to a certain threshold, which is maybe not coincidentally about $2 million, you are opening uh, um, your business up to a lot of new bidders to, that were not previously interested uh, when you're doing half a million in free cash flow. Uh, and it's interesting that that also appears to be the threshold for this type of transaction. I mean, it, this is not like a linear thing where you know you, yeah. you go up a dollar and then yeah you get you know maybe some increased multiplier effects it can really hockey stick and dramatically increase once it you does. get above and that I was threshold. just going to add to that very point grant it's not linear if yeah. you're using your example if you're a half a million dollars it's nothing wrong if, if your company's making half a million dollars and you and your family take well taken care of bless you you that's an american dream you've won yeah that's phenomenal you, you won. Right. and let's say your value at that case is two million Okay, we'll just use a nice multiplier for keep it math simple for me. I don't have my calculator grant ready like you do. But if they were to increase it Cheater. to $1 million, it's not a multiple of four anymore. It could be a multiple of six. So, and it yep. keeps going up and the risk goes down geometrically. The larger a company gets, the risk goes down geometrically. And you get to a certain point where you have at least a million dollars of EBITDA or you have maybe not a million dollars of EBITDA, but some great IP, you can do some great things. You could be a great candidate for a strategic transaction because there's a lot of small, big, big players out there looking to suck these things up for a good price without. And you can also find ways to create it, you know, get deferred payments and payouts, you know, minimize your tax rate. I always tell people that the tax benefit of ESOP is great, but don't make the decision solely on the tax benefits. Think about the employee. You have the deep bench and is an investable product with what you have on the table today. That's something we talk about here too, is, is you, you just can't let the, the tail wag the dog. Uh, yeah. is, you know, fo focus on what's important to you. What are you trying to get out of the transaction? What, uh, what does life look like for you and your family after you exit? And then start putting the pieces together from there. And, and this might be an option that complements your vision or you know, frankly, it might not be. And that's okay, too. There's, that's why there's a lot of options. No, there are a lot of options. And we can go back to the key point is succession plan, plan it, and really know what you want to do. And you, you're not married to the idea. You might go through the idea and say, I'm going to do a private equity, hypothetically, and you're into it six months and you see all the pitfalls of it. Well, a lot of the things that you've done for the private equity transaction do not preclude you from doing other transactions. You still should be doing some window dressing on your balance sheet. You still should be putting in the right controls and all these other things that you can benefit and leverage from. So when you plan to do something, just go through it. And we're at, we're at a great point right now, early in 2024. This is the time to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And by year end, I'll do A, B, and C, and I expect my value to be X. Right, right. So how did you get into this stuff initially? You said you, you're, you're an accountant by trade, right? And then you've been in private equity in the past. What does what your career look like? I've been, uh, after graduate school, I joined PricewaterhouseCoopers. I was uh, in an international group. I've literally traveled and worked with them all over the world. I spent three years in uh, Brazil with the firm. I spent... Uh, considerable amount of time in uh, London. Uh, then I joined uh, Citibank Venture Capital Group, did an IPO in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, an automotive. And then uh, they transferred me for the next transaction, which was a medical device company in uh, Los Angeles. I saw how the big boys were making all their money and doing all these things. And so 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago to the date, by the way, I started my own firm. Uh, while, while doing this, I co-founded a, a private equity firm. I, I sold that out uh, just before the uh, pandemic. I guess I was a little bit lucky in life. And uh, now I'm just focusing on uh, my firm, Lakewood Advisory Group. 
and going through doing business valuations and help people plan for these strategic financial transactions. It, it's a lot of fun dealing with the people going through this process because you meet them and you, you get to plan with them, uh, show them what their options are. Why, uh, you mentioned that you had lucky timing with the sale of the private equity group. Why, why, why sell the private equity operation instead of the business advisory operation? Uh, yeah, it's a good, very good question, Grant. Candidly, when you, when I was in the private equity firm, you buy a company, say $50 million, and that would happen on Tuesday. On Wednesday, I'd be on a plane traveling around the world with hat in hand, raising money for the next deal. I enjoy working with the company and doing the planning and everything else. And I've uh, been so long in the uh, financial service and consulting thing that I decided to uh, keep that route. I, I still work with a lot of private equity firms and a lot of transactions, but uh, I, I prefer to do the, just stay with the uh, consulting firm. Sure, and, and, sure. And I'm having so much fun. I mean, I retired perfectly candid for about six months and no more than that. You can only hit so many golf balls, Grant. And I'm just having fun doing it. Too. And I, seriously, I'm looking for the project I'm going to be starting next week. And it's a lot of fun. Good for you. It's, it's refreshing to hear you, you, you tell the story. What's, uh, what's next? What do the next few years look like professionally? I think the uh, next few years will be focused on uh, some estate. We do a lot of work with the states and uh, ESOPs. Uh, I previously did a lot of work with the distressed companies, helping them be, before they go into bankruptcy to turn around or buy a strategic uh, transaction. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, get more in, uh, involved in not only the number crunching, which uh, we don't do that much. Our business valuations also include analysis of the industry. We really roll into the market. We test the products. We do a lot of intellectual property, which is very challenging because by definition, if someone has a patent, there's no other product like it in the world. So what's the value of that? You know, you got to be creative and find solutions. Those are the things that I, I really enjoy doing. And, and as well as uh, traveling. I I think I've been so far 34 countries or something like that doing all these projects. So, uh, good for 40, you. For, 47 states, 34 countries. 47 states. What are what are the three you're missing? Montana, Wyoming, and Hawaii. My wife reminds me how how can I be missing Hawaii? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like she wants to go there too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it's been great, Michael. I, I really appreciate you spending a little bit of time and, and sharing some of your, your wisdom. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting concept for me. You know, most of the people that we talk to about these types of transactions uh, are, are not quite doing $2 million in, in EBITDA. Uh, but what I'm, I'm really happy that we touched on is what the options and the possibilities are once you get there. Uh, and what the mechanics of all this stuff is and what the potential for tax deferral is it, because it, it really is substantial if you're willing to, you know, stick it out a couple more years and do the work. The, but the key is, as I said, you got to plan and do these things. Failure yeah. to plan is a plan for failure. If someone's going into this year and doesn't have their ideas written down, everybody says, well, I, I got to back my mind. No, you don't. You know, market your plan because if you have it in the back of your mind, the rest of the team doesn't know what the heck you're talking about. And it's not fair to them. And don't yeah. let the uh, budget and your plan be driven by the P&L. Take a look at your product. What are your services? What, what's the capacity for your people? Those are the important things to take a look at. They drive the P&L, not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, how can people get a hold of you if they think that this sounds interesting and are, are uh, potentially a good candidate? Please just go to our, our website and uh, or send me an email from our website. You'll see the email address. The website is lakeledag.com, L-A-K-E-L-E-T-A-G, as in golf, dot com. And we have uh, free consulting. You know, I, someone sends me the balance sheet or something, say, are we a candidate or what should I consider in this thing? I wouldn't mind just doing a spreadsheet and spending 15, 20 minutes with them over a cup of coffee or a Zoom meeting and see if we can help them out. 
we all got to help each other out. You don't know. It may be a client, yeah. it may not, but let's see what we can do for each other. Yeah, right on, right on. Well, thanks again, Michael. It's, it's great to meet oh, you. I, I really appreciate you being I wanna, here. I want to thank you. It's been a great experience. <laughs> I've enjoyed it too. Until next time. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners optimize income, pay less in tax, and invest prudently. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google, Spotify, or wherever you digest podcasts to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes and announcements. And feel free to submit questions to growmoneybusiness.com.